Hello, everyone, and welcome to Business Talk, our weekly University of Rio Grande and South Center's podcast show. We're here at the University of Rio Grande TV studio. Not only are we doing live internet radio through Blog Talk Radio, but we're also live on the Jackson Educational Access Channel and Channel 17 University of Rio TV channel. Our podcasts are archived and placed on YouTube for viewing and listening again. Our mission is simple, to promote the University of Rio Grande and its diverse educational programs, promote the Ohio State University South Centers and its many business technology programs, promote the various small business and economic support organizations, and finally to promote Southern Ohio, a great place to live, learn, and enjoy life to the fullest. Co-hosts include Jason Winters, Director of the Center for Small Business Entrepreneurship, and Mike Thompson, Instructional Design and Media Services Director, both with the University of Rio Grande. We also have Patrick Dangle, Business Development Specialist, and Kimberly Rausch, Program Assistant, both with the OSU South Centers, and myself, Justin Dugan. Who do we have today, Patrick? Uh, Justin, first of all, it's great having you uh, on the uh, show. Um, for, for those of you who don't recognize Justin, Justin has been behind the scenes and uh, he had the opportunity today to uh, be, be on the, the show. Today we have a, a special guest. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, David has, has uh, uh, done something unique that I'll share with the, the uh, audience in a little bit. He helped us to convert just from the radio into the TV. Uh, so, uh, David Nate Nadler uh, is the uh, Chief Risk uh, Manager Director at the Ohio Valley Bank. Uh, D- David has uh, uh, a long career in the banking industry and in, in working and in, in helping individuals. And, and David's going to talk uh, uh, about uh, a few financial pieces of information that we have found to be uh, uh, very important for our listening audience. David, welcome. Thank you, Patrick. It's good to be here today. Um, I have been uh, with Ohio Valley Bank for 10 years. Um, of course, the bank's been around a long time since 1872, uh, located right in Gallia County. Um, we've, we've had a long history of doing things first in our county. Uh, we had the first ATM we had the first uh, bank that was open in the evening and on weekends. Uh, we had the first uh, office with free parking. Believe it or not, that's commonplace today, but, but Ohio Valley Bank several years ago was the first one to offer free parking in our main office. Um, today, most of our first are involved in technology. Uh, we've got iPhone apps and, and other mobile uh, devices, um, technology, basically trying to reach out and make banking easier for you. Well, I, I, I found that uh, to be rather interesting. As a matter of fact, uh, if, if one goes to the uh, website, it is filled with a lot of uh, very good and useful information. Uh, sometime in the very near future, we're going to be bringing on uh, 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 an individual that uh, is helping the children to better un- understand financial information, etc. cetera. Uh, but, uh, as we go along, tell us a little bit about yourself, how you got involved, where you come from, things of that nature. Um, I actually uh, kind of started my business career by owning a restaurant. I uh, had a pizza wow. restaurant in Colorado. Um, uh, for those of you that have been in the, in the food industry, uh, banking is the hours are much better. I can guarantee you that. <laughs> um, and, and I moved from there into through a kind of a, a string of events into banking. Um, got an MBA, and, and like I said, I've been with the bank for 10 years. Um, and I guess that's my, my history, Pat. Hey, Where are you originally from? Uh, you have to rephrase your question because that's kind of loaded for me. Okay. Was I, I moved around a lot when I was a kid. I was actually born in Halifax, Nova Scotia. Oh, wow. Um, and then I moved to New Orleans, and I moved to Delaware, and I moved to North Carolina, and then I moved to Kentucky, and then I moved to Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, and then I moved back to Kentucky, and then I moved to West Virginia. And when I moved to West Virginia, I was in fifth grade. Wow. So Is that military related or not? Nope, nope. No. We just moved around a lot for some reason. Wow. Different okay. university every year, it seemed like. So 
Uh, but we kind of settled down in West Virginia, and I graduated from high school there. Okay. And, and where did you go to, uh, uh, to school? Uh, I got my bachelor's degree from the University of Wisconsin. Uh, I got a actually double majored uh, math and physics. I think one or two more classes, and I'd have had a German major also. Um, go Badgers, then, huh? That's right. That's right. <laughs> I don't. Uh, I don't have my shirt on today. Um, Is that the honey badger or not? Uh, uh, you know, I don't know which badger it is. It's just a badger. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, his name is Bucky. Okay. Uh, after I got my uh, bachelor's degree, I got a master's degree in math. And then uh, after that, decided that I wanted to go to the Olympic Training Center. And so I moved to Colorado. I loaded all my stuff up in my car in a little tiny trailer and moved out to Colorado. And that's kind of how I got in the pizza business. I uh, couldn't continue my, my Ph.D. math program out there. So... Got involved in pizza and did that for about eight years. And We're in Colorado. Was that Denver? Or the Colorado Springs? Springs. Springs. Okay. Yep. Um, Great place out there. And, and I know that you're uh, married and you have uh, some kids. Yeah, I'm, I've, I've been married for a long time. Got married in 1994. Before uh, the turn of the century. That's right. Uh, <laughs> I've got two great kids. Uh, one of them is going to school at Wellston High School. Is doing great. And my son is in school at Saints Peter and Paul in Wellston. Very good, very good. And just out of curiosity, did uh, your your wife help you with the pizza shop? Yes, yes. We work together sometimes. Of course, she had her. She's a computer programmer, um, and uh, so she had her day job, so to speak. But there were times we worked together, and you know, obviously, anytime you work together with your wife, that tests your relationship a little bit differently than uh, yeah. other times. Well, well, you know, I, I've had the opportunity to work with a number of, of individuals that uh, want to start pizza shops, want to start uh, uh, different restaurants because they think it's easy <clears throat> and that all they have to do is uh, go to a bank and uh, get a loan and then get a grant and they're, they're in business and they, they make all sorts of uh, amount of money. Well, you better just make sure you have some experience and know what you're doing before you <laughs> go get a loan because they're you know they they can fall pretty fast if you don't know know what you're doing uh, that that is very very true so w what is a risk chief risk director what what is that well my job at the bank is is well a bank's job is really to manage risk um, that's that's pretty much what we do you know whether it's interest rate risk uh, which would be managing how interest rates change or credit risk, you know, managing, giving loans to the right people at the right rates, um, or any number of other risks that you might have. Um, that's pretty much what my job is to balance those. Um, there's there's all kinds of ways you can manage those. Um, you can buy insurance that'll cover you if something bad happens, um, or you can diversify. You know, for example, the bank we do lots of mortgages, so that helps us diversify um, geographically as well as you know to people that work in different places. Um, but long story short, you know, that's that's my job as a risk manager is to make sure that we're not uh, putting all of our eggs in one basket. Uh, one thing I guess I was going to ask is you said not giving loans to the wrong people, so to speak. Do the loans come through you to get assessed or do you just say if they don't meet this limit or criteria, then they don't? Well, it's not that we don't give loans to the wrong people. We have sort of guidelines that we follow, parameters for depending on what type of loan it is, um, that we want those parameters to be met in order to extend the credit to a borrower. Now, I'm typically only involved in commercial loans, um, which commercial loans are they're a little bit harder to underwrite um, on on the residential and consumer side you can have some pretty hard and fast rules. And while there's judgment there, there's a little less judgment than on the commercial side where you really have to look at the business and evaluate how the business is doing and, and what the prospects for the business are. And, and that process is just a little bit different than, you know, if, if Mike, you would come in and want to learn, you know, you get a paycheck and that's pretty much it. We don't, we don't come back and go, okay, well, how's University of Rye Grand doing? And we just know you're working here and hopefully, uh, if you quit working here, you can get a job somewhere else and still make your mortgage payment. Right. Now, things have changed. My dad, what he liked when he was in banking was, 
I guess maybe breaking the rules. Or, you know, there weren't so many rules as far as, okay, this is the limit. You've got to have this much money to, to get this kind of a loan or whatever. And just knowing the people and their character and allowing some le- more leeway that way. Right. You know, even since I've been in the banking industry, really, it, it's changed a lot. Um, and, and just like you speak, it used to be, you know, kind of a handshake. And, you know, if we knew you, we could give you the loan. Um, and even when I started the bank, you know, when we looked at a commercial loan, I mean, we did some analysis, but we didn't do a lot. And that was just 10 years ago. Mm-hmm. And that, you know, spring forward to today, and we have all kinds of metrics and numbers we look at. And, and that's really um, honestly been driven by regulation. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, I guess it's nice to go back to the good old days, you know, where it was a handshake. but. You know, there's a reason the regulation there, and I won't say that's all bad, but it does, to some extent, tie our hands um, and can make it hard for us to help out, you know, local businesses when the numbers aren't there. I'd like to know, um, what is what is the importance of a credit score and what are the effects of... You know, credit scores are, you know, there are three major companies um, that that generate credit scores, and basically they've got a, they've got a black box that they use, and... All kinds of parameters go in there to determine what your credit score is, and it spits a number out. Um, Most banks today, especially when you're talking about like a car loan or a house loan, they will use those credit scores, and they will use those credit scores as a big component of both whether or not they give a loan to you and whether or not what kind of rate you get. So if you get a lower score, your interest rate's going to be higher. Um, If your score is low enough, you may just get flat out denied by the bank based on on that score. Um, and obviously, you know, Ohio Valley Bank doesn't have a, you know, a spreadsheet that we stick those numbers in. And if your score is too low, we just don't look at it. You know, we typically look at all, all of our loans. So we take a lot of other things into account besides just the credit score. And there's a certain more, there's more freedom in a local bank rather than say a national chain, right? Yeah. You know, as, as a bank gets bigger and you know, I won't, I won't pick on big banks, but because they're bigger, they can't spend a lot of time on smaller loans. That's just the nature of if you're bigger, then you don't have as much time on the little deals, mm-hmm. um, which means that the rules have to be a little more stringent. And, and you, for a big bank, you probably have to fit in the box more than you would a local community bank. Well, aren't you finding that uh, as we've been going along in a number of different banks, uh, had to close or sell out because of uh, the economy uh, that that larger banks are becoming dominant and smaller community banks are becoming less and less you know there there is a trend towards fewer banks in the country um, and then you know there are just a few banks that hold uh, most of the assets uh, but that doesn't mean that there's not a, a place for a community bank like a high value bank. You know, we have our, our niche of products and services that we can offer that the community needs, and that's what we try and do. Um, the, the bigger banks, they have their niche that they serve, and, and that's good for them also. But, uh, you know, we try and stick to what we can do and do well, and uh, so we can stay in business and be in here another 100 years. And I know that you provide a variety of different services. Let, let's talk a little bit about the, the uh, housing, the home economy. Um, you, you sitting in, in your chair, you've seen a lot of different things that have happened in the last 10 years. Our, our economy is based on the, the housing market, is that correct? Yeah, you know, anybody who's looked at, uh, you know, GDP figures for the country knows that the housing market is a big, especially construction, right, is a big part of our um, overall economy. So what happened then, you know, probably since the year 2000 or so, is we had a lot of people building houses. And that kind of ramped up and ramped up and ramped up. And I won't pick on anybody in particular, but there were some You know, you you saw this housing appreciation. So people could, you know, every year or two, they could jump in from one house to another, you know, sell their old house, buy a new, bigger, fancier house. Sort of flipping thing that the people were doing. And, you know, that got, and probably from a lack of maybe 
enough oversight or the right kind of oversight um, into the banks extending loans. Some banks, and not Ohio Valley Bank, but some banks were doing loans that you know, might have a really low rate for the first two years, but then the rate would get much higher after that. Um, and that's just one example, but a number of loans that basically, a long story short, that guy that bought that house, some of them, in the long term, they couldn't pay for that house. But the assumption was the price of the house would increase and they could sell it after a time. Well, what happened when housing prices stopped increasing and people started losing jobs, now all of a sudden we had all these houses on the market and people couldn't afford them anymore and we had rates that were resetting and people's payments went up and they couldn't afford to make their payments. So that kind of that's kind of what made the housing market crash and we're still today trying to work through that because uh, basically we have a bunch of houses on the market that we don't really have people that can afford them and uh, you know basic economic supply and demand if there aren't any buyers out there to buy a house then what's your house worth well not as much as it would be if you had 10 people that wanted to buy it so that's kind of what we're working through right now in the economy um, and you know every day we see you know areas where you know housing prices have decreased or uh, or you know some places are increasing luckily for us in our communities we haven't seen um, seen it quite as bad as some of the larger towns have seen um, now we've had some depreciation in prices uh, most of our depreciation in, in Gallia County and surrounding counties has been in in the higher end homes um, the typical houses haven't haven't really seen a lot of depreciation um, but obviously when those big homes go bad then it's not good now the the rates right now are are low right uh, this is late 2012 yeah just since we put it on YouTube it might live forever uh, is that an artificial thing to stimulate the housing market why you know it used to be that like 10 or 11 percent used to be a low rate for a house loan but now it's what two something yeah rate rates have been very low for a long time you know that's kind of the the, the fed has been doing any number of actions and that, that's a whole nother uh half hour we need to spend on that but <laughs> you know there's there's some activity by the government and the Fed trying to keep rates low and they're doing that not only for housing but to spur you know businesses to borrow and encourage uh, things to expand um, to get the economy going again because the economy is still kind of grinding pretty slow um, and <coughs> you know right now I, I don't know what the rates are today but a few days ago I looked and you could get a 15-year mortgage um, if your mortgage qualified for 2.25 percent so I remember when I got my first mortgage 15 years ago, and I think it was 8.75. So that's obviously a, a much lower rate of interest, but that's because, you know, banks, that's why we don't, I guess that's why banks don't pay a lot of money on your deposits, because what we pay on your deposits, then we have to lend it out at a higher rate. So if you think about the bank only getting 2.25%, uh, it's only natural that the days of 5% CDs are gone because then the bank would be upside down. Mm -hmm. So, you know, to a certain extent, um, it's not the bank's fault that your deposit rates are so low. Sorry, everybody out there that's got a lot of money on deposit. Um, that's just the way it is until kind of the economy turns around and rates start to creep up. I, I, I do have a, a question on, on the different loans. Now, m many of the uh, on my house loan, when when I had that, it was it was whatever the percentage was on the unpaid balance. But there are some loans that, uh, regardless of your unpaid balance, it's a, it's sort of a, a fixed on the the total amount. And, and one of the things that I I noticed with the student loans, uh, with Sally Mae and things of that nature, um, it's not the necessarily the percentage of the unpaid balance it's the percentage of the total amount and, and so um, can, can you speak a little bit about some of the different different ways uh, uh, di different kinds of loans and based on the percentages and things of that nature I, I Pat I think what you're referring to is maybe the the type of uh, repayment yes um, 
typically loaned, you know, a car loan or a house loan, typically those loans are uh, fully amortized. And what that means is, um, assuming the interest rate never changes, um, you've got the same payment for the whole term of the loan. So if you get a 30-year mortgage, you make a monthly payment for 30 years and it's the same payment every single month. Uh, same thing with a car loan. You get a 60-month a car loan, it's the same payment every single month on a car loan. So, so that's a fully amortized loan. Uh, some loans are structured uh, that you might pay 2% of the balance. Okay, So the assumption there is that the 2% is enough to both cover whatever interest, depending on your interest rate, had accrued during the month, plus pay some principal, so that over time, obviously as you pay principal, you're paying 2% of a smaller number, so your payment will go down over time under a scenario like that. Um, then you've got student loans where you might get a student loan as a freshman and you're not expected to start paying that back until after you graduate. So that loan might have no payments for a few years and then would go into some type of, uh, some type of repayment structure, whether that be fully amortized or 2% you know, of the balance. See, I know this is going to date me, uh, but my student loan, uh, when I attended college back in the 70s, or 60s, wow. Did they pay that in shekels back then or something? <laughs> Roman coins. Yeah. Uh, it was 3% of the unpaid balance. Uh, and and as our, our children get older and they go to college, etc., and helping them with, with the, the finance, you know, college is expensive. Um and when you get involved in the, the Sally May, uh, different kinds of banking rates uh, are dependent upon, you know, I, I have one uh, uh, son who has student loans and one daughter who has student loans, and then uh, th there's a difference. And uh, I, I know that's becoming a hot topic uh, in the coming years with, with so much debt from students. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, the government is, is, you know, Sally Mae in particular is big into student loans. Um, and, and most of those loans are, you know, the banks originate those and then and sell them to that government entity. Um, and, you know, you, whichever, whatever Sally Mae says, that's, that's how you have to underwrite those. I see. I see. Um, and and I, I know Ohio Valley Bank uh, not, does not just have house loans or car loans uh, th there's there's equity loans uh, second mortgage loans well we'll do a second mortgage on a house uh, we we have a product called a capital line too that you know it's kind of like a line of credit that you can use the equity in your house um, to get a loan you know one of the problems we have today and this this is true of either uh, one of our capital lines or just a straight mortgage is uh, being able to underwrite those and what I mean by that is we we sell some of our mortgages in order to get our customers the best rate to uh, Freddie Mac Freddie Mac has certain rules and guidelines and Freddie Mac is it's a government sponsored sponsored entity and basically what they do is they'll buy mortgages and then uh, packages package those mortgages uh, sorry package those mortgages up um, take a little slice of commission and then sell those to somebody that wants to invest in a, in a big pool of mortgages. Like a bond? S something like a bond? Yeah. Uh, you know, so a lot of times banks will buy those. Um, but what happens is, for example, if you come into Ohio Valley Bank and want a, a Freddie Mac, um, that's how you get your best rate. But Freddie Mac has all these rules. And then you got to pay Freddie Mac fees. And then you got to get your house appraised, and we run into this problem a lot. Um, Somewhat like the VA and uh, FHA loans that you used to get for your house. Mm -hmm. So you have to have certain inspections had to meet yep. certain criteria. Yep. And what's happening now on appraisals is it's not so bad if you live in a live in a big city and you're in a subdivision, and there are 150 houses just like yours within half a mile. Um, as you know, out here in Southern Ohio. Uh, we don't have subdivisions like that. Most of the houses are different, and we've got a lot of rural houses, you know, out in the country. So you might go to get your appraisal, and the nearest house, you know, what we call a comparable, a house that's similar to yours, might be 25 miles away. 
Well, what Freddie does is they come in and say, say, oh, well, that house wasn't comparable because it wasn't close enough. Or um, your house has a pool or some kind of special feature. And so there's a big adjustment um, to get from a comparable house to your house. And Freddie, get, Freddie might look at that and go, oh, well, we can't take that appraisal either because the adjustment is too big. So what happens is even though your credit score might be really good and you've got no problem taking your mortgage payment, making your mortgage payment, you can't get the best rate from Freddie because basically of where you live. You know, your, your, your house doesn't fit in Freddie's box. And so a lot of those we have to do in-house um, and we do do those and we, we work with our customers as best we can. Um, but, you know, my job as a risk manager is what's our risk? And we have to be real careful about booking loans that are 2.25% because what will happen to us since we're not government sponsored is when rates start increasing and we have to start paying 2% or 3% or 4% on CDs again, when you're still paying us 2.25% on that house mortgage, we'll be in trouble. So we have to limit our exposure to that interest rate risk. Um, and we're, we're encouraging a lot of our customers to go with uh, adjustable rate mortgages. Now these aren't like the ones we talked about earlier in the program. These are reasonable adjustable rates where in one, three or five years, they'll adjust to a reasonable rate. Um, not with very low introductory rates where the rates uh, go much higher later on. Okay, we've got about three minutes. I see another thing that you wanted to talk about was what to know about foreclosure. What did you want to get across about that? Well, pay your bills and don't do it. You know, foreclosure, <laughs> <laughs> foreclosure is never good. Um, That's usually the best case. Y <laughs> you know, um, Foreclosure is basically the bank's coming after you that they're going to, it's kind of like repossessing a car. Mm -hmm. um, the process is a little bit different, um, but you don't want to do that. And even if the bank forecloses, you know, <coughs> typically uh, they're going to come after you for whatever, you know, if, if we have to foreclose and, and say the bank can only sell the house for, for 80000 and you owe the bank 90000 then the bank will want to try and get the other 10000 from you. So... It doesn't really let you off the hook. And the worst part about foreclosure is banks typically can't sell the house for as much as you can. So you're, you're always better off selling that house yourself, um, even, if it's, even if it's for less money than you want, because the bank probably won't be able to get that much money out of it either, you know, after you've left. And I could tell you some horror stories um, about, you know, some of the things that happen when we have to foreclose on a house. And, and foreclosure doesn't necessarily mean bankruptcy or those can correct it just means you know if, if you have defaulted on some provision of your loan typically by not making the payment um, then that gives us the right to come and, and initiate foreclosure how long does that take I mean uh, two payments on, or five or a uh, year or typically one? that wouldn't happen you know kind of in the banking industry 90 days is kind of the bogey um, if you're so if you're three payments behind um, the bank will probably start talking to you about foreclosure. Now, does that mean they'll initiate proceedings right away? No, um, but that certainly puts it on that radar. And that's partially driven by, you know, regulations require us to classify loans a, in a certain way when they become that far delinquent. And does that, that probably changes your, uh, oh, uh, your number, your credit score. Uh, yeah, yeah. If you've if you're delinquent on your loan 30 days, that will definitely affect your credit score adversely. Right. Okay. We've got 60 seconds. So, anything you want to wrap up with? I think I'm pretty much done. It's it's been great to be here today. Um, I hope that I've maybe helped clear up uh, some questions about uh, risks that banks take and and the foreclosure process and how now everybody knows not to have anything <laughs> foreclosed upon um, and I hope when you when you need a loan you come to Ohio Valley Bank and talk to us well I, uh, I, I know firsthand that Ohio Valley Bank is very open uh, to discussing uh, their very, uh, confidentiality is very very important to them uh, and they are a, a community bank that has been in the, the area David I, I thank you again for for coming Thanks, Pat. And uh, next week, we get to interview Justin, 
Dugan. Uh, Justin's our camera person and stepping up to the uh, microphone. We're going to find out all sorts of interesting things about him. And then the following week we have uh, uh, Leslie Postal, who's with State Farm, about talking about recruiting. Thank you. I'm Patrick. It's Justin. And Mike. Thanks for watching.